Well, we're in Revelation uh, chapter 2. Uh, I'm not going to try to rush things. I, I felt like I was pressured in, in my own soul. No one made me feel pressure. I just feel that way, like, oh, we got to hurry up. we got to get this. But I'm just going to do eight, 8 through 11 tonight. One little church. See what we can do. Jesus is writing this. Jesus is revealing this book to John, the Apostle John, his servant. And he says in chapter 2, verse 8, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write. So Smyrna's got a letter coming from Jesus. Smyrna is a church in Asia, one of the seven churches that's going to hear, the, hear what Jesus has to say. And each church gets their own little private special letter before we get into the whole book. Now, Smyrna is not a small city. You think of Smyrna, a small city. You've got Ephesus, which is a big city. Smyrna can't be a big city. It's a small city. No, it's not. It's about 200,000 people in the first century. So that's a pretty good-sized town. And it was about 40 miles north of Ephesus, also on the uh, Aegean, Aegean Sea, had a port and everything. And it's uh, the only one of the seven churches that John wrote to Jesus said, right to the seven churches, it's the only one that's still there. The city is still there. Um, still inhabited by people. It's called Izmir is the name of it now. Um, and it was said in the ancient world, it was probably one of the most beautiful cities in all of Asia, just a pretty town. And there was a church there. And the church got there probably like a lot of the churches in Asia uh, was when Paul was there some 40 years earlier when he was in Ephesus and he preached the gospel and the gospel spread by Christians taking it everywhere else. Acts chapter 19, verse 10. This Paul was there for two years in Ephesus. Actually, he was there for about three years uh, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. So they heard it in Smyrna too because it was just 40 miles from Ephesus. So somebody went up there and shared the good news in Smyrna. That's probably where this church came from in that, re in that period of time right there. And then he says, To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, in verse 8, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. Jesus is addressing himself to the church. Like the other intros to the other church letters, Jesus is speaking to them using phrases from the revelation that he gave to John in chapter 1 when he saw the, 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 the man uh, behind him uh, using phrases from that vision. The full description of him is in chapter 1, and he uses those same words here in chapter 2, verse 8. But in chapter 1 it says, I am the first and the last. Same thing he says here. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. Here he says, these are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. So this is Jesus describing himself in the same way that he was described in chapter 1. Now he just uses those two phrases. He is the sovereign, eternal God, first and last. That's what that means. It's the same phrase used of uh, Yahweh in the book of Isaiah. He's claiming He's claiming this for himself. That's who he is. He is the eternal God, first and last. And he is the resurrected Lord. He was dead. He was crucified on the cross, and he came back to life again. So that's, that's where we are here in chapter 2, the church in Smyrna, to the church. Write this. This is Jesus writing to them. And just like all the other letters to the other seven church, the other five churches now, after this one, Jesus knows what's going on. He knows. He knows everything. He is God. He is omniscient. And he knows especially everything concerning his church. It's his church who he died for. It's his church who he brought to himself. They're his people. He knows what's going on with them. And he tells them in verse 9, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. So he knows their situation what's going on with the church in Smyrna. He knows everything about them and the church in Smyrna, and they have this dominant characteristic about Smyrna. He doesn't say anything bad about Smyrna, anything negative about Smyrna. There's like only two churches that he writes to where he doesn't 
criticize them about something. He doesn't rebuke them or reprimand them or, uh, or reprove them for anything. This is all good stuff. He knows it, and they have this characteristic about them at this church, and that is that they're facing affliction. Uh, some translations say tribulation. Um, they've already, already been facing it, and there's more of that to come for them. The dominant characteristic of this church is they are going to face pressure. That's what the word means, pressure. It's the same word Paul used in 2 Corinthians. We looked at this a few weeks ago, uh, chapter 1, verse 8. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships. That's translated hardships there. We suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. So the word affliction, the word that describes what's happening to the church in Smyrna, affliction, tribulation, means pressure. It means to be squeezed. They've been put into a narrow spot between a rock and a hard place. That's what it means. They've been, pressure has been applied to them uh, at this church. And the, it's the dominant characteristic of the church in Smyrna. And the reason why they're being pressured, the reason why they're being afflicted, the reason why they're being persecuted, the reason why they are being uh, suffering hardships and pressure is because they're genuinely faithful to follow Jesus Christ. They are in trouble with everybody else in the world, in trouble with the Romans, in trouble with the Jews, in trouble for uh, just believing Jesus, not following, not uh, worshiping, not giving in to the Roman emperor. See, back in those days, the Roman emperor called himself God and you had to worship him. They wouldn't do that. So they were accused of um, atheism. They didn't worship the other gods. Like you had these officially official sanctioned gods of the Roman Empire. Well, the Christians didn't worship any of that. So, well, if you don't worship all of our gods and you won't worship the emperor, you must be atheists. That's what they believed. That's what they were being persecuted for. They would not follow these other things. They followed Christ. They were faithful to Christ. And the text says here, one of the key features of their persecution, one of the key features of their affliction is poverty. Destitution means they have little or no money. They have little or no possessions. So here's a church that's poor. Uh, the word means abject poverty of a beggar. Oh, I know you guys. I know you, Smyrna. Y'all are, uh, I know your afflictions. I know the pressure that's coming upon you. And I know your poverty. And here's what happens. If you're being ostracized by your friends or ostracized by your family, ostracized by the people in your community um, and cut you off from the cultural things and they cut you off from economic life of the city, uh, then your financial resources dry up and you're poor. You have nothing. They might have had something before, but they don't have it anymore. By being discriminated against by people who don't like Christians, you might even lose your job. So if you had a good job, they say, if you say a Jesus' name one more time, you're fired. What do you do? You go in there and you say, hey, Jesus Christ died for your sins. You're fired. You can't be rehired. And maybe even so, uh, so much pressure, so much difficulty that the government would come and confiscate your property. They did that too. Take your stuff. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34 says the same thing about the, the people that the writer's writing to. He says, you sympathize, you sympathize with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So this has been pretty common for the church. You're a Christian. You're faithful to Jesus Christ. You're faithful to worship him only, to faithful to serve him only and not the cultural pantheon of idols, not the movie stars, not all the fancy stuff that the world wants you to worship. You have nothing to do with that, Jesus only, and they persecute you and, and may lose your job. It's not the same here as it was there, but they will confiscate your property too. So the church in Smyrna 
key feature, key characteristic of this church is it's very poor, extremely poor, barely eking out of life, not able to meet their basic needs. This is the problem. This is the church. Not a rich church. Don't have anything. Yet Jesus says, yet you are rich, he says to them. Which definitely can't mean possession rich because he just got through talking, you're poor. You're beggars. You don't have any food You don't have any food to eat. You don't have any way to pay your rent. They took your stuff. You're poor, but you're rich. So it means they're spiritually rich, and they're spiritually rich because they're in Christ. They believe in Jesus. What did it say in Hebrews there we just read? Because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. You're rich. You've got possessions that are better than anything you could have here. You have things that are glorious, not just shiny, but glorious. You're rich. They're rich because they possess eternal life. They're rich because they're rich in faith. Christ is first in their hearts. Christ is first in their affections. Christ is first in their loyalties, so they're rich. Paul writes to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, uh, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich. He doesn't mean financially rich. He doesn't mean materially rich of possessions. He means spiritually rich through Jesus' poverty coming down, leaving his throne in glory, becoming one of us and dying for us becoming poor himself so that we might be rich spiritually and get to inhabit uh, eternal glory with him. Possessions, we can't even imagine what it's like now. Paul's talking about the, to him as an apostle and the difficulty they're facing, which is part of this whole letter. We'll get into this one day in 2 Corinthians, hopefully not too distant future. Uh, chapter 6, verses 9 through 10 he says, we're known, yet we're regarded as unknown. We're dying, yet we live on. We're beaten, and yet we're not killed. We're sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Then he says this, poor, yet making many rich. We don't have any money, but boy, we show up in town, people who believe the gospel get saved, and we make people rich. He says, having nothing and yet possessing everything. It's a spiritual wealth, not material wealth, spiritual wealth. James says, listen, dear my brothers, chapter two, verse five, listen, my dear brothers, has God not chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? This is... Spiritual riches and material poverty. This church has, Smyrna has, is poor, materially poor with possessions, but rich spiritually. And this is a slam. I, I, it blows my mind. You can't read the book of Revelation. You can't read about this church of Smyrna and come out with some prosperity gospel like that's out there in our world now. Like who would ever believe that God's purpose for you Generally, overall, this is God's umbrella will for all Christians is to be rich. And here's this church that's poor. And Jesus is saying, you're poor, yet you're rich. Your riches are not material possessions, they're spiritual riches. I like this when he says in Matthew 19 to Peter, you know, he says, what will we get? We left everything to follow you. It says it's easier to go through a camel to go through the eye of a needle, the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom. Well, we left, and they're like, well, who can be saved then? And we left everything. What's up? What's going to be for us? It says in Matthew 19, 29, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my sake, it means you gave up everything of your possessions to follow Christ will receive a hundred times as much 
and will inherit eternal life. Now, he doesn't mean you could get 100 times richer in this world. If that were the investment, everybody would be following Christ. If, if you gave up all your stuff, and then a year from now you had 100 times that, who wouldn't be a Christian? He's not talking about that. He's talking about spiritual wealth, spiritual riches, spiritual riches, eternal life. So this church is poor, yet they're rich. And then Jesus says in verse 9, Revelation 2, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So one of the main sources of their persecution, one of the main characteristics of their persecution is poverty. One of the main sources of their, character, of their persecution and their affliction are by those who call themselves Jews. And what they do is they slander you. The Greek word is blasphemia. We get our word blasphemy from it. Just a transliteration of a Greek word. And blasphemy simply means to speak evil. Speak evil of you in an intense and severe way. They say things about you that are evil. They maliciously uh, slander you. Blaspheme. They blaspheme you. They accuse believers of all kinds of things. All right, because the believers celebrate the Lord's Supper, which is the body and blood of Jesus, you know what they called them? What's that, what is it if you eat somebody? A cannibal. They called Christians cannibals. Um, if you uh, greet one another with a holy kiss every Sunday, and call out everybody brothers and sisters. They think it's some kind of sex cult, some kind of a goofy, crazy stuff, and they accuse them of being immoral. They really were accused of this. Like I said before, they were accused of atheism because they weren't polytheists like all the other people. And they accused them of a political disloyalty because they wouldn't bow down to Caesar. Doesn't mean you don't like Caesar. Doesn't mean you're not going to obey Caesar. Doesn't mean you're not going to pay your taxes. It just means you're not going to worship him. Well, if you don't worship him, then you're a political dissident. And we're going to persecute you some more. And this is going to be the normal life, not just for the church in Smyrna. This is the normal life for anyone who follows Christ. You will be slandered. You will be blasphemed. You will be persecuted with people's words. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 11, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, insult you, like you moron. You... What's a good word, Dave? <laughs> you know some good... No, uh, he call you names. And then he says, And falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. They slander you and they blaspheme you and they say, they accuse you of things you didn't do falsely. They accuse you of things falsely. And these slanderers that do this to the church in Smyrna, they call themselves Jews. But they're not really Jews. But having said that, I do need to say they're in Smyrna is a very large community of Jewish population. So they are really ethnic Jews. They really are Jews. And the Jews, the Jewish community was always opposing Jesus. That the Jews were the main source of antagonism to Jesus Christ and his ministry. They're the ones that said crucifying the Jews. The Romans just did what they were told. The Jews were the ones that murdered him. They were always opposed Jesus and his ministry. They were against the apostles. They attacked Paul. They brought false charges against Paul numerous times. So these are Jewish people, but Jesus calls them, um, Jesus says here that they're not Jews. They call themselves Jews, but they're not Jews. Not because they're Gentiles who think they're Jews. They really are ethnic Jews. But the point is, is that these people thought they were the only true people of God. They thought they were the only ones that knew God and anyone who claims to know God in any other way besides the way they were taught through Moses, through the law, is false, and so they would slander them. They thought they were the true people of God, but they're not. 
Jesus calls them a synagogue, which is what the Jews met in, a synagogue. Instead of a synagogue of God, of the true God, they're a synagogue of Satan. And they're a synagogue of Satan because, as Paul says in Romans chapter 2, 28 and 29, a man is not a Jew if he is one own, if he is only one outwardly. Nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. These people in Smyrna who were persecuting the Christians in the church there weren't true Jews. They weren't circumcised in their heart. They were not Jews inwardly, so they weren't true Jews. Roman, uh, Paul also says in Romans 9 verse 6, not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. There's a physical descendants of Israel, but then there are spiritual descendants of Israel, of Abraham. But they're the true Israel. There's one episode in John chapter 8 where uh, the Jesus says, um, if you hold my words, if you hold my teaching, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. You're really my disciples if you hold my teaching. And they said, well, we're Abraham's. We're, we're, we're Abraham's. What do you mean? We've never been slaves. So they start arguing with him. These are after, it says, after many people believed in him. He says to those who believed in him, if you hold my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. They start arguing with him. And in that argue, argument, they get to this place where they say, the only father we have is God. And Jesus says, John chapter 8, 42 through 44, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and now I'm here. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you're unable to hear what I say. I just want to chase the rabbit for a second. It doesn't say, why are you not able to hear what I say? Because my language is unclear to you. He says, why is my language unclear to you? Because you cannot hear it. You not un you can't understand. You're unable to understand what I'm saying. You're unable to hear. That's why it's not clear to you. Verse 44, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus told them to their face, your father is the devil. So then when he says to the church in Smyrna that the people who are persecuting you, they call themselves Jews, but they're not really Jews. They're not true Jews. They're, they worship in the synagogue of Satan. They're children of the devil. God's not their father. If God were their father, they would believe in Jesus. But they don't. That's what Jesus is talking about here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul says about the Jews. He says, you suffered from your countrymen the same things that the people of Israel suffered from the Jews. He says, the Jews, they displease God and are hostile to all men in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. So the Jews, people who are Jews, are not real Jews. They're children of Satan. And God's wrath has come upon them. They always do what displeases him. They never please him always heap up their sins to the limit. So these Jews that are persecuting the church in Smyrna are not real, true Jews. That's, that's what this church is dealing with. They're dealing with a large population of Jews in their city who are saying slanderous things to them, but they're not really Jews. They might be ethnic children of, of Abraham, ethnic children of Israel, but they're not true Jews because they're not circumcised in their heart and they belong to their father, the devil. And they always displease God, and they're hostile to all men. And so Jesus says, verse 10, Revelation 2 again, do, do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. 
I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Jesus' words to them are not, and I should have the word not in there in your notes, Jesus' words are not particularly a commendation to them. He's not saying to them, look how good it is that you're suffering. He's not saying that. He, he is pleased with this church, and he is commending this church because he has nothing bad to say about this church, but he's not saying to them, look how cool it is that you're suffering. I'm really proud of you for suffering. He's not saying that. His words to them is simply this. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid about the suffering you're about, to ha- you're about to endure. You're going to suffer persecution. You're going to suffer difficulty for just being a Christian. Church in Smyrna and every other church that might be like the church in Smyrna who is faithful to the Lord Jesus. It'll even get bad, guys. The devil will get you arrested. Now, I would love to chase this rabbit. We, we, we won't have time, uh, and I didn't really prepare notes, but, you know, the devil is not really in charge of the world. I mean, he has control because God gave him control. He's, Martin Luther said, the devil is God's devil. He's not out there doing things on his own. He, he doing things on his own power. He can only do what God gives him permission to do. And yet G- Jesus says to the church, the devil will put you in jail. He will get some of you arrested. The handcuffs are coming and you're gonna be in a cold prison cell. I'm telling you, I would rather be tortured than to be put in a cold jail cell with no covers, no blanket. I hate being cold. That's what's gonna happen to you guys. But don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Be faithful. Be faithful. Jesus said in Matthew 10, uh, 21 and 22, brother will betray brother to death and father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Verse 28, same chapter. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. If you're gonna be afraid, be afraid of God. He can, he can send you to hell. Don't be afraid of people who just can kill you. They can't do anything to your soul. So don't be afraid. Remain faithful. Don't be afraid. Don't fall away. Don't be afraid. Stand firm to the end. That's what he says in Matthew uh, 10 again, a few more verses. Whoever acknowledges me before men... I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. Whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. So remain faithful. Remain faithful to Jesus. Acknowledge him. Don't be afraid. Acknowledge Jesus. You're going to suffer. You're going to suffer pressure. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be sent to prison. And you're going to be sent to prison just to test you. You know, back in those days, if you got sent to prison, it wasn't like a... You went to prison for a year, and then they let you out. A lot of times if you went to prison, it was just a wait to be sentenced to death. You weren't out on bond. You weren't out on bail. You were in prison waiting for the execution sentence to come down. But Jesus says here, uh, where am I at? You will suffer persecution for 10 days. Now, I have to interpret 10 days. What does that mean? Anybody know what 10 days mean? If you take it literally, it's 10 days. Well, if it's a literal 10 days, I'm not sure I know how to interpret it because when did it start and when were the 10 days over? And if it's just 10 days, what's the big deal? I mean, 10 days is being in jail is bad, but really, what's the big deal? What does he mean by 10 days? I don't think he means it literally at all. It could be a short span of time. Uh, But still, 10 days is a limited time. I mean, I think it's something similar to what Peter writes in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, He says, verse 6, 
In your salvation, you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have to had you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. You rejoice in your salvation. You rejoice in this eternal life that you're going to get. You rejoice and you get to get to see Jesus and be with God forever, even though now for a little while you're suffering. Even though now for a little while you're being persecuted. Even though now for a little while there are trials that come your way. And I'm not talking about a kidney stone. I'm not talking about um, mother-in-law problems or father-in-law problems, whichever is worse. Talking about persecution for the sake of the gospel. It says the same thing in 1 Peter 5.10. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory, that's the context, he called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. So 10 days likely just means, not a literal 10 days, but in other words, whatever time you have to deal with suffering in this life, here and now, in the secular world we live in, I'm suffering for the sake of Christ and I'm being persecuted by the Jews, being persecuted by the Romans, being persecuted by the government, they're confiscating my property, I'm poor. Whatever that is, it's really a small, short period of time. Um, It's only until the day you actually meet the Lord when he comes again. It's a short segment of time before the return of Christ. It's, no matter, 10 days just means what you're going to have to deal with and being persecuted is really going to be short-lived, not just in terms of this life, but short-lived no matter how long it is. It's only 10 days. So don't be afraid. And by the testing you, he just means, are you going to endure and persevere in your faith? Whatever the testing is, whatever the persecution is, whatever the prison sentence is, whatever the some of you put to death is, are you going to stay with Christ? James says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. When you face trials, Be glad because now you're getting to persevere. You get to learn what perseverance means and perseverance will finish its work and you'll be mature and complete and you'll be glad. Not liking anything. So don't be afraid. It's a test. In verse 10, be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you the crown of life. James also says, same chapter, chapter 1, a few verses later, verse 12, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, the very same thing, the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. In other words, the crown of life means eternal life. Persevere, be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life, eternal life. That's what it stands for. That's what it means. You stand firm to the end and you demonstrate by standing firm in Christ to the end that you truly are one of his, that you truly belong to him and you just persevere to the end. A sure sign of a real believer is perseverance and faith. You can't fall away. You persevere. Even if it means you die. And especially when your faith is tried by suffering, persecution, and death. Anybody can persevere if you don't ever have to suffer, right? If you don't have to suffer, perseverance doesn't really mean anything. If you have to suffer, then perseverance to the end, he who stands firm to the end will be saved. He who stands firm and perseveres and is faithful even to the point of death will get the crown of life. That is the church in Smyrna. That's the implication. This is their church. Hey, Smyrna, I know your suffering. I know your affliction. I know your poverty. I know the Jews that call themselves Jews that aren't really Jews slander you. I know that you're going to be persecuted and put in jail, put in prison. I know that they're going to kill you. But you're not going to give up. You're not going to abandon Christ. You're not going to fall away. 
they will be faithful even when it comes to dying for the sake of Christ. That's what this means. And by implication, it also means, because it's really in there, it means that Jesus is pleased with this church. Jesus, the first and the last, the one who died and rose again, he's pleased with this church. He has no reproof for them about anything. He's pleased with the church in Smyrna. Verse 11 says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. And we just got through saying this is the right, the th- these are the words of him who is the first and the last. These are the words of him who died and rose again, Jesus. But here it says, he who let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The words of Christ in the, it means the same thing as what the Spirit says. So the Spirit speaking to the church is what Jesus says to the church. What Jesus says to the church is what the Spirit says to the church. And he used this word, he who overcomes. It's the Greek word, uh, nikao. We get our English word. Well, it's not really an English word. It's uh, Nike. The Air Force used to have a Nike missile, air surface air missile, uh, Nike tennis shoes. It means victory. It means conquer. It means win. Those who conquer, those who win victory by faith, those who hang on and believe to the end will not suffer harm by the second death, which means hell. Those who ever come aren't going to hell. That's what it means. I know that's what it means because at the end of the Revelation, it says it a couple of times, but I'm just going to pick one of them. It says in that Revelation 21, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. They're going to hell. This is the second death. So he who ever comes won't go to hell. He who ever comes will not be harmed by the second death. It's not going to have any effect on them. We'll look at that some more uh, as we go. We're out of time tonight. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for your word. Thank you for revelation. Thank you for letting me have this opportunity to teach it tonight. Lord, I pray that you will uh, work grace in all of us here as you promised that we would be blessed if we read it. Bless us. Fill our hearts with joy. And Lord, if, if it's your will and it's what your word seems to say, that those who believe in Jesus will suffer persecution, will be hated by all men, handed over. Lord, I don't want that to happen, but I do want your will for my life and I want your will for our church. I know that the church in Smyrna pleased you. I would like for South Strand to please you. So have your will with us. And Lord, if suffering comes, let us remain faithful. Let us not be afraid. Let us endure to the end. For just a short while, where we will have the crown of life with you, not be harmed by the second death. Do that for us, I pray. Father, I pray you'll bless the rest of our evening. Uh, Keep us safe as we go home. Bring us back together again Sunday uh, so that we can enjoy uh, fellowship, your word, singing praise, all the things that we do here on Sunday. Between now and then, bless us and use us and glorify Jesus in our lives. I pray in his name. Amen.